Well, everybody, welcome to the Basel Book Company virtual event series. We'll be checking, uh, robot ticket takers are checking you in. Um, I'm Daniel from Basel Book Company. We have a vibrant virtual event series that is occasionally in person, maybe. Um, while we get, uh, before we check, before, while people are being checked in, let me mention a few of our upcoming events. Um, tomorrow we're hosting um, Nicholas Butler, the author of Godspeed. Um, you might know him from his book, Shotgun Love Songs. He was, is a Wisconsin favorite, and this is his first book, not based in Wisconsin, because it is about the building of a mega mansion, and there is just no property that's expensive enough to make the plot work. So he'll be in conversation with Andrew J. Graff, the author of Raft of Stars, um, tomorrow, July 29th at 7 p.m. Um, next week, we have our first in-person event. Uh, Christine Hansen, the author of Wisconsin Farms and Farmers Markets, Tours, Trails, and Attractions. She's going to be in conversation with Lori Friedrich. Um, that's Wednesday, August 4th at 7 p.m. You do need to register for all our in-person events as well on Eventbrite, um, just in case. Uh, we hit capacity, which we've lowered with COVID, or we have to move it virtual. And then um, Andrea Bartz next week, uh, or the week after, uh, the author of We Were Never Here in conversation with Jennifer Hillier. She is an Elm Grove native, Grove native and she was almost going to be in person at the Elm Grove Library, but uh, due to a very exciting turn of events with a major book club, uh, we moved this virtual. That's Monday, August 9th at 7 p.m. Um, you can find all the registration links at the baselbooks.com page. Don't forget today's event is a webinar. Questions can be submitted by Q&A. The chat is open and automated closed captioning is available. And now, because we think most of you are checked in, let's get to the main event. Today is day 4,500 of Boswell being in business. Welcome to the Basel Book Company virtual event series. I'm Daniel Golden. And tonight's event, uh, I've mentioned a few others, but they all pale in comparison to this one. Chuck Wendig is here for his latest novel, The Book of Accidents. Um, the book is taking America by storm, or at least the horror world. Um, I want to just mention a few quotes. Christopher Golden, uh, author of the best-selling Road of Bones, says Chuck Wendig's magnum opus uh, is blazing with imagination, humanity, and a tiny glimmer of hope for a world drowning in cruelty. It's horror for right now, and Wendig's best so far. And Amakatsu said, only Chuck Wendig can blend horror, fantasy, and science fiction into a propulsive thriller that is funny as it is frightening, clever as it is uncanny, tender as it is terrifying, a magical ride. And the Boswell, the Boswellians are weighing in too. We've got a lot of fans in the store. Uh, Jason Kennedy said, I love this book. It took me back to the heart of the 80s from King Cannon to Coots. And Chris Lee said, definitely my top three for the year for everyone who loves horror and everyone else who wants their, to dip their toes into some murky magic waters. Let me just give a little bio. Chuck Wendig is the author of books such as The Wanderers, the Star Wars Aftermath series, the Miriam Black thrillers and zeros, as well as you can do anything magic skeleton, monster motivations to move your butt and get you to do the thing alongside the world of comics, games, and film. He's a finalist for the Astounding Award for Best New Writer and served as the co-writer of the Emmy-nominated Digital Narrative Collapsis and is also known for his blog, Terrible Minds. We are so lucky today to have Chuck Wendig in conversation with Kirsten White, the New York Times bestselling author of books, including the Anti-Darken trilogy and the upcoming adult debut Hyde, her novel, The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein, was Frankenstein, is in development with Sony Pictures Television. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you both. Um, I am going to turn things over to you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I am super excited to be here hosting Chuck. I was able to read The Book of Accidents um, several months ago, and I absolutely adored it. I have been very, very excited to pick Chuck's brain about it. Um, I did tweet him vaguely threatening things as I was reading it, but I no longer wish to threaten him in any way, shape, or form. Um, I still accept so yeah, threats, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I still accept all threats. It's okay. Yeah. By the way, I really like that it matches your backdrop. Like you've got a very book of accidency yes. thing. Yeah, I actually repainted my eight-year-old's room just for this event. Just for this. Um, because I was like, you know, well, we gotta we gotta make it match. She's like, Mom, my favorite color is orange. And I was like, I don't care. Um, I'm a really good mom. So <laughs> Some fun facts, Chuck and I share an editor, um, Trisha Narwani, who's brilliant. Um, and I feel very like, I feel very cool um, about that. We oh, also- We share, are cool. I mean, we're really yeah, cool. About yeah. Um, we also, fun fact about us, we share a recurring nightmare, Do we? but we can't tell you what it is because then it will infect you and you will also have it. So we're just going to move straight into the questions. Yes. Yeah, um, don't worry about it. Just move on. Yeah. Don't, move don't on. think about it. Don't think about it. Um, so I want to start off with just something light and fun to go along with this very light and fun book. So fun. I wanted to talk about generational trauma. Yay! Woo! Party poppers. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but I did want to start there because I feel like the best horror and the best stories in general, but especially the best genre and the best horror is rooted in very, very real life stories, right? Yeah. And this for me is a book about the ways in which we haunt ourselves. Um, and generational trauma. So I just want to know what was the genesis of this idea? How did you decide, like, I want to spend several hundred pages dealing with generational trauma in a really scary way? Uh, first of all, you said, like, the book is about the ways in which we haunt ourselves. And I was like, oh, my God, that's so good. <laughs> let's, let's just end it now. End the whole session. We did it. We yeah. solved the book. Uh, yeah. Where does a book like this come from? Um, it's, a, it's weird. I grew up in a haunted house. Uh, and I grew up with a family haunted by all of the things that families can be haunted by. Um, and when it came time to tell my dad about the house being haunted, he kind of treated it like it was like, because he was like Mr. Tough Guy, John Wayne. I always say like he cut his own pinky off with a pair of bolt cutters. Like he's that, he's that guy mm -hmm. to save money of all the things. So um, yeah, yeah. That's one does. So, as one does and then it became a fun party game like pull my finger and then you would pull his finger but he would then replace it with the pinky and you'd be like ah and kids would freak out anyway that's totally separate so um when i went to tell him about like hey i think the house is haunted he was like no that's not true like nah, how dare you like this kind of like tough guy routine of like that's nonsense why are you bring this to my door and uh but later after he had passed away and i talked to my mother she was like, oh yeah, your dad totally thought this place was haunted. And he saw stuff all the time. And he had stories that, and then my grandmother had stories about, I was like, why we could have talked about this if you weren't haunted by your own weird generational trauma, we could have talked about it. And now I feel like I have to find him as an actual ghost and talk to him about ghosts. Like it feels in cycles, circles and cycles. So mm -hmm. somewhere in there, book of accidents exists. Okay, cool. Um, so you open a haunted house. That just, I feel like that answers a lot of questions that we didn't even know we had. <laughs> so like, many questions. Well, they check makes so much more sense. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so how did you go about, you know, as, as a writer, I read a book like this and, and I find it very, um, not intimidating, but impressive, right? Because uh, the longest book I've ever written was like 118,000 words and it almost killed me. Um, this is a very long book. It's a very complex book. So how did you go about deciding how to tell this story? Because every time you think you know where the story is, all of a sudden you push down to another level and then another level and then another level. Sometimes literally you're pushing your characters to another level entirely. Um, how did you decide, how did you set out to structure this book? I love that you think I had a plan there. <laughs> Thank you for giving me that credit. Usually I do have a plan when I write and I did not uh, mm -hmm. in this case have any plan so um you know with a book like wanderers i kind of knew that general i don't want to say format or structure but that sense of like that sense of descent and constantly like i'm gonna every time you think you know almost like in a good season of television like when yeah. lost was really firing well yeah. like you'd get to the end of the season and then they would take the island almost like a chessboard and just like knock it over and mm -hmm. you'd be like what what I, and you are not left on steady ground. So I knew that that was an aspect going into the story that I wanted to tell that it starts as a haunted house and then kind of develops into a haunted world and then just kind of continues to, I continue to sort of turn the knife after I stuck it in you. So um, that was the, the, the overall impetus for the structure and how to tell that story. But um, uh, Trisha, who is uh, blessedly in our, uh, I think, chat section right now, uh, was such an essential part of kind of just like finding 
the the story and the bridging all the pieces that were in there and making them like we talk about how it wasn't just like you know it's great when like it's like surgery you're like oh you need to cut this arm off they have a third arm and it's a very bad arm and we don't well, you need to cut your in. pinky off with bolt you know, when you cut your pinky off with bolt cutters and yeah. a hospital party yeah. uh and it wasn't like that it was like it was like rewiring neurons and capillaries it was just a, a very uh sort of a frankensteinian kind of rebuild of some of the stuff that wanted to go uh, come in the, uh, out of the book. So um, it was really a book, I think, born in the editor, at least it got up and walked um, when the edit happened. I love that. And like, I find that really encouraging. I'm guessing that we have some writers and aspiring writers in our audience tonight. And like, I love hearing that. I, I think it's very encouraging because I think sometimes writers feel like they have to have everything figured out before they start. And <laughs> you'll find from professional law, there's a lot of times we don't. And a lot of times, yeah the story is discovered in the telling of it, right? Like you don't know what the shape of it needs to be until you've done it wrong. And then you, like you said, I am actually wearing a Mary Shelley shirt right now. <laughs> oh, that is a great <laughs> shirt. Hmm? That's a great shirt. Thank you, yes. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, you, you find the story in the telling of it, right? And you tell it wrong in order to figure out how to tell it right. Um, that actually makes me feel better because I was like, this is so complex. Like I bet he had it all figured out ahead of me. Yeah, ahead of time. Nope. So I'm glad. I'm glad no, you this did. is definitely a build the parachute after I've jumped out of the pool kind I of situation. But I, but I love that, and I feel like this is such an organic horror story. All of the elements are so personal and so so driven by humanity that it that it makes me really happy that this was a book that just kind of came together and built itself from the ground up, like like people do. Um, so I want to talk about my favorite character. My favorite character is Maddie. Um, Maddie is the mom, um, the, the wife, the mother, the artist. She has many, many different roles in this book. And the thing that I love the most about Maddie is she's a good mom and a good wife and a good person, but she's also a deeply imperfect one. Like she's not, you know, exactly what her husband needs. She's not exactly what her son needs. She messes up. And I love that those two things are allowed to coexist, right? We're allowed to see like Maddie is a good person and good at these roles, but also she's imperfect at them. And that tension is sort of where she lies. And I love that. Um, and I feel like all of the characters are that way, right? Like no one is one thing, which is true in, in life as well. How did you go about discovering these characters? How did you go about building them? Um, because you have a lot of really well-developed characters in this book. And I feel like everyone can come to this and find that character they, they connect with. So for me, it was Maddie, but you know, Oliver was sending every, everybody. So how did you how did you go about developing these individual characters? Um, it's sort of a like a complex layering. Like you over time, you develop ideas about people and about characters, which I mean, both real people and then the way characters are structured. And you sort of find the things that you think need to be different <laughs> with characters. Like mm -hmm. I didn't want Maddie to be the type of person who has to give everything up because she's a mom, but I also didn't want her to then not be a mom and be like, I'm just career. How dare you talk to me? And like, you know, I wanted the dad to be one of those dads who's dealt with some really rough stuff, but then, and that's in there, but I didn't want it to just be like the classic sort of like, well, thus he's abusive or thus he's, yeah. in fact, it's sort of dealing with that question of how do you translate all of the pain inside of you without then inflicting that pain on other people but if you don't handle that well and you don't wire your pain well what does that do to you personally and it's just and then Oliver being like you know a kid who's born I, I think of this precious moment that we're in right now which is a really confusing strange place for kids to be and it and it was when I was a kid too and I, I relate to a lot of what I think um, Oliver is going through but he's mm -hmm. even going through things that well, I as a kid certainly didn't have to go through like shooter drills and things like that and I thought um, here's just a unique lens for each of these characters to see pain and trauma and then to, but also to give them a good heart at the core of it and not just be um, one of those families because the family is themselves kind of a character. I didn't yeah. want them to just be one of those families that is a, a secret keeping self-destructing family. Not that there's anything wrong with telling that story, no. uh, but I feel like we've read that story a whole lot and often in horror, you don't see um, especially these days, characters who are really holding it together really well, or if they do, they've, you know, the one member is gone, or there's a parent who's dead, or mm -hmm. whatever it is, there's all these sort of sacrificial cuts that must be made, and I really wanted it to be about this core unit of the family holding together, and then that makes the stakes higher, because you care, ideally, more about their love for each other, and then how vulnerable it makes them all to that. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the 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 drama and the relationships, you never went for like the cheap drama, the like, oh, they just needed to communicate and everything would have been solved. Like, yeah. no, they communicate, they're just not necessarily doing it well. Or right. because of the things that they're bringing to the table, that communication isn't working. And I love that. Like I love seeing such a complex, real family dynamic at the center, like the beating heart of this horror novel. I loved it. Um, and thank you. Thank you for Maddie, by the way. Thank you. Um, yep. you know, uh, as, a uh, as a weird side note with Maddie, Maddie is like the sort of core core of, of Maddie comes from, I wrote this, these books, the Miriam Black books, which is about a character who can see her, you're going to die when she touches you. And she's uh, very foul mouthed and a, a total mess of a human being. But by like the last book, she starts to be less of a mess and she becomes a mom. And I, I, I some people always felt like I kind of maybe corrupted that character by making her a mom. Like she was so independent and cool. And suddenly mm -hmm. she sat up with this damn kid. But like I was having, you know, we had a kid at that time and I felt like it was a weird, I understood it, but it was kind of a weird criticism. And so, like the inspiration of Maddie comes out of like, I wanted to sort of alternate world Miriam into that, like she's grown up and has a kid and she's still sort of a, a foul mouth person with some sort of a messed up core. But um, I mean, Maddie is ultimately a way healthier person than Miriam uh, ever could be, but it's like, it, it, there's that germinated seed sort of at the center of it. Yes, I, I love that. I love that you were like, oh, here's this criticism of the thing I did. So I'm gonna double down and I'm gonna do even more of that. Yeah. That's why there's two prologues. I just yeah, like. yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> I have written an entire series because somebody complained that one of my narrators in an earlier book was too angry. And I was like, oh, you See? don't like angry narrators? Cool. Here's a lot of the impaler. Um, <laughs> Spite, it works. Spite. It's such a good motivator. I love it. But also I feel like it, it, it causes you to engage. And it says, okay, you know, what about this character weren't they liking? Or what about you know, Miriam becoming a mother, do they think will somehow lessen who and what she is? Instead of like, I found with motherhood, like it deepens everything you are. It exacerbates everything yeah. you are. Like you are yourself, but you're also having to be yourself for other people. And like, that's, that's complex, right? And, yeah, it's, it's and just an interesting character journey. Yeah. 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 I love that. Okay. Um, so I just have a lot of really random notes. Um, I, I'll take them all. My favorite note I have here is animals behaving unnervingly. Um, That's that the name of the book. That is one of my favorite tropes. Um, I loved as you were as we were um, pitching this event on Twitter, trying to get people's eyeballs. You were threatening people with raccoons. The raccoons, little hands, man. They're little yeah. hands. Yeah, They're you so had, you posted that gif with them coming up under the yes. deck. That's like right. terror. So creepy. Okay, so what is your favorite like unnerving animal? What is your favorite unnerving animal fact? Because you have like several very creepy animal things here. You have ants trapped in a death spiral where they're just yeah. going around and around the circle. You have a deer behaving wrongly, which, you know, if you've read The Only Good Indians, you're like, no, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Yeah, sorry about that. That's some, that was nasty. <laughs> that wasn't good at all. Um, uh, what is your favorite like unnerving animal fact? Do you have one? I feel like- I mean, the, the easiest one is because I put it in there, which is the ant spiral. It was fascinating yeah. to me that they can get into a situation where they've created like a pheromone trail to, to hell like just like you've created a, like a Lamarchand box at a Hellraiser just like I, I feel like that's high school though right pheromone trail to hell. <laughs> exactly. it really is exactly yeah <laughs> um and then the other thing is just wasps wasps which I adore wasps are really great um animals for the ecosystem but like they are straight up xenomorphs like we have this wasp that uh lives on our deck and it's called a grass carrying wasp and it's this long thread waisted wasp and they're actually kind of elegant looking up close they're kind of neat looking but they um we noticed that like we have a metal chairs and metal table and there's rivet holes underneath it um some of them are filled with rivets and some of them are not uh the ones that are not they often seem to be flying around like constructor drones with these giant pieces of like it's like mustaches like pieces of grass like there's a little wasp and this long piece of grass and they're like they'll try to buzz around your head and you're like why what is happening like there's this piece of grass tapping me in the face and it's just a wasp and then you like read up and you find out that they're stuffing that grass into a hole and you're like oh that's interesting they're making like a little nest and then you realize what they've done is they've found tree crickets like little katydids and and paralyzed them and shoved them up in the hole and just just pile them with eggs and then are stuffing the grass in so that you know their little babbies have a warm meal and you're just like that's terrifying that they're just like seems cute and fun and then you're like oh there's like a they've mummified a, a 
cricket and shoved it up there and they're, they're like putting a tomb, they're making a tomb for their babies. Well, all right, nature is horrifying. That's sweet. Yeah. I mean, you can't get scarier. You can't get more horrifying than nature and you can't get more horrifying than history, right? Like right. a lot of times aspiring writers, um, I'm sure you give this to the young writers would be like, you know, what should I major in? What should I, what should I do if I want to become a writer? And, and the answer is just be interested in the world around you. Be interested in history, be interested in current events, be interested in nature, be interested in that creepy wasp filling, you know, your chairs with mummified insects. Like yeah. all of these things um, are going to show up and they're going to give you ideas and they're going to, you know, lend themselves to really, really disturbing imagery in Chuck Wendig's novel. <laughs> <laughs> True. All right. Um, What's your favorite animal? Like, I feel like that's a, that's a question you have to answer. You know, my favorite weird animal fact is I have a tortoise. I have a so called a tortoise. Um, her Love name is Kimberly. Yeah. Uh, actually, the fun fact, all tortoises are by default named Kimberly. They're born named Kimberly. You can choose to change their name. But but they are all named Kimberly. That's science. Um, Hashtag science. Yeah yeah it's it is it's science. Um and and they're so cool they're like just having a dinosaur in your backyard right she has like, <laughs> patterns depending on the time of year she has like a patrol that she does but a cool fact about tortoises is they are not herbivores they're omnivores they're just too slow to catch almost anything. <laughs> I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so we no longer have snails in our backyard. She eats all the snails because, fun fact, snails are slower than tortoises. Escargo, um, baby. But every once in a while, we'll go out and she will have found some carrion and we'll have to like pull a mouse spine out of her mouth. And she gets really mad. It's like, that's her mouse spine. Um, she earned it. She's like so a yeah, dog. Um, tortoises are right. omnivores. They just can't catch anything. So oh if you stand so long enough around one or say you were to die in your own backyard and you have a tortoise, they will very gratefully and very gently and very slowly eat your body. Oh my God. That's like vultures. Everyone thinks vultures are just scavengers, but once mm -hmm. in a while, if they can find a vulnerable bit of prey, like ba sometimes baby cows, they'll go for a baby cow and eh, nature, yeah. nature. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if Kimberly, if Kimberly could eat a baby cow, she would. I don't she think would. she would. I don't think she could though. Yeah. But she Maybe would just try. nibble a hoof, nibble a hoof. Yeah, she would, she would give it the old college try. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so I have a question about um, about how long your books are. Oh, yeah. What, how long did it take A, to write this book and B, to edit it? Because I know you're also writing middle grade now, right? Yeah. And middle grade is amazing because it's like, you know, this is a third the length of other books. You're done editing it before you would even be like a third into your That's other true. book. Yeah. But also I feel like, editing length gets exponential, right? The longer the book is, the harder it is to edit, the more yeah. moving pieces. And this is a book with so many moving pieces. So just, just I'm in the middle of like five deadlines right now and I want to feel better about myself. So tell me how long all this <laughs> is what I'm uh, saying. That's a good question. I don't remember exactly how long it took me to write. I want to say under six months to write the first draft, but then mm -hmm. like we just edited it, kind of a rolling edit through the early pandemic and even before it. So I don't even know if that took another six to eight months. Like it was just yeah. sort of a, like we go through a draft and everybody kind of sit with it for a while. And then there'd be months later, be like, no, no, there's a little more. And he's like, we passed this through these readers and they kind of felt this. So like, what if this and then this? And it was like, oh yeah, okay. And so yeah. it just took time. And it wasn't like steady time. It wasn't like yeah. we sat down for eight months and wrote this 100 and whatever, 50, 60,000 word book, but um, which is short actually compared to Wanderers. I was Wanderers gonna is, say, that's not that long for you. No, I think 280,000 words for Wanderers. This is downright breezy. Yeah, but before that, like my books are usually pretty short. Like the oh, mirror really? black yeah. books are usually like 70 to 90. And mm. uh, But then even now the middle grade, I think was like 80. I wrote a 60,000 word book and they're like, we need more of it. And I was like, no. No, no I wanted to do 60. Like, this yeah, is so nice it. and tidy. And they're like, yeah, nope, sorry. Uh, we need to we need to do more there. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, oh, this is a good question. So Keith McKenzie just said, did I hear him say, we edited the book, who's we? Oh. Um, and that's a great question. So, so most published authors, most traditionally published authors work with an editor. So basically what happens is you have the idea for the book and you know what it's supposed to be. And you sit down and you write it and you revise it and you revise it and you take it as far as you can. And then you realize it is not the book you want it to be. And then you turn it over to your editor and you're like, I'm so sorry, please help me. Yeah. And then they're like, 
this is what's great. This is great. This is great. These are the questions that I have. And, and in asking those questions, they basically like open it up and allow you to see the things that you were too close to see, right? Like I find, I find that's what I get too close to the narrative and I can no longer see the shape of it. I can no longer see it. And an editor brings in those questions that allow you to find the book that was always there, right? I, I know yeah. a lot of writers are afraid that an editor will change things. Editors don't change things. Editors, editors give you the ability to create the book that you always wanted to, but really just couldn't on your own. Good editors don't change things. I have had a few editors who were like, I just changed that. Like, no, oh no, you did not. Uh, yeah, like it's the most cliched saying is that like forest for the trees thing, but that is literally what it feels like for me is like the inability to see your way through a dark forest. And then an editor is like, I have pulled you out of this and I'm going to give you a map. You didn't know that this was the map of the dark forest, but this is how you walk it. And you're like, that is what I was trying to do. Thank you. That is exactly, I was trying to get from here to there. Thank you so much for this. And um, so in this case, the we is, is Trisha Narwani. Um, just really like the greatest. I mean, her edit letters are a thing of a uh, ter terrifying beauty. Yes, yes, hundred yeah. percent agreed. And and yeah, that's that's how I feel like about all of my editors. I've been very fortunate with the editors that I've worked with. Is I take things as far as I can, and then they help me figure out that last bit of how yeah. how to actually get the book that I wanted to write. Um, and it's so it's like it's the weirdest thing because it's so humiliating in a way, right? Like, you're like, I'm a professional. I've written how many books? I just turned in this book to you. And like, how did I not see yeah. this? Like, these huge things that were wrong with it, right? So you get the editorial letter. I, this is my process. I get the editorial letter. I open it. I read it. I close my computer. I just have an absolute meltdown. Like, just yeah. internally. Uh, externally, just I'm fine. But yeah, I just like, internally, I'm like, I'm a failure. Yeah. My editors are ready, ever working with me. I'm going to go walk into the sea. You walk it's into it. the city, which you know is pretty close to me. I live in San Diego, so it's always an option. Yes, yes, um, yes. And and then I give myself about a week. And after a week, all of their questions, I'm like, yep, hundred percent right, hundred percent right. Okay, they have this question. How can I answer that? And like, yeah. so after I've had that week to process everything, then I dive back in. And at that point, it's exciting, right? Like, I yeah. love doing revisions. Yeah, my favorite thing about it is when you're like you read that like one criticism or question, you're like, no, no, that's wrong. You don't understand the wait. Well, all right, hey. And then suddenly like, there's like the tumblers and the lock opens. You're like, oh, I didn't even know that that door was closed. And there's a door there. That's so good. Yeah. yeah. And it's nice too, because you learn the books are moving parts, right? Like they're all interchangeable moving parts. Yeah. And so this thing that you thought absolutely has to happen in this specific way, you get those questions from your editor and all of a sudden you're like, oh, no, I can make that happen in a way that matters so much more and that has so much more meaning to the book. So did you have any moments like that in the book of accidents where maybe there was something that you thought had to be in there or something you thought had to be a certain way and then you ended up leaving it behind? There were definitely like, I mean, we cut like a lot of just little stuff out, little mm -hmm. scenes and little bits. So, I mean, but the thing was like pacing was interesting for this book because there are parts of the book I wanted to be, obviously the book is big and I wanted to be paced somewhat peppily. Like I don't want it to be necessarily a thriller, but I want the chapters short and yeah. end, end out on a sort of interesting hook. So you're kind of dragged uh, forcibly into the next chapter and ideally you're addicted to it and you, then you become a, a cult for the book, whatever it is. I'm just saying, I'll take a cult. So, yeah. um, but there were parts where I really did want it to kind of slow down a little bit. Like there's a scene uh, where a kid goes into a coal mine. It's one of the interludes and it's a very long interlude. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was sort of essential that that be kind of played out, but we still kind of trimmed it down and we're like looking at ways of sort of sculpting it to be a sharper piece, even though it was still going to be long. A sharper pickaxe. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's some other stuff where like, I try not to spoil, but where Nate goes on a trip, let's just say. Yeah, and Nate's that was originally, yeah, a yeah, work trip. That was one big section. Oh, and like when I first wrote it, I was like kind of needlessly adamant. I was like, it needs to be a big section because it needs to feel like its own sort of book inside the book, mm -hmm. um, which is a cool idea, but it really doesn't work in practicality because it takes you out of the rest of the book, which yeah. is not what I want. So uh, it was just, and there became a case of like, well, how do you break this up and then place it judiciously throughout? Um, and that was much better, but then it be, that, and that was a fun puzzle to solve to sort yeah. of figure out how you like, 
thread that through. It's almost like a weird uh, bridge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. so funny because um, so my book out next year that that I worked on with Trisha as well, Hyde, which I'm is my book. Thank you. I am too. Um, I. <laughs> I really tried so hard to get away with that book within a book. Um, I was like, maybe she's not going to call me on it. Maybe she's not going to call yeah. me on it. And then she was like, I feel like maybe having this huge chunk in the middle, that's another book. And I was like, ah, oh, you didn't let me get away with my lazy journal of exposition. Yeah. See, yeah. She caught us both on our bullshit. And we're like, I know. I know. They Damn it. Do. They always do. Yes. We need, we need a our... worse editor. Yeah. <laughs> We just need a bad editor who's like, who cares? Exactly, exactly. Somebody who, who cares less, but yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, okay, so one of the things that I love about the Wheel of Accidents is you got like everything. You know the, the, the old um, Saturday Night Live skip where he's talking about clubs and everything that they have? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've got creepy amusement parks. Uh -huh. You've got lightning transportation. You've got yeah. serial killers. You've got abusive fathers who might not be dead. Yeah. I'm like, all oh, the best things. Yeah. Was there anything? Like, and, and as I was reading it, as a huge fan of horror, I was like, he's doing it. He's doing a haunted amusement park. He's doing it. He's doing this. And like, if I... I I know in retrospect that it wasn't all there, but I did have this sort of like giddy joyousness of like, I know that you love this genre because so many like really fun hallmarks of the genre make an appearance in this book, which is even more impressive because none, the, the narrative doesn't depend on any of them. The narrative is entirely dependent on the family at the core, right? So is there any horror trope or sort of like, not necessarily trope, but sort of like big horror set piece or um, type of horror storytelling that you wanted to fit in this, but you couldn't? I really, before ever writing it, I was kind of like, I thought maybe this would be like one of those, and it is at its surface, like a small town horror. Like, <laughs> well, it's set in this town and there is evil lurking there. But I don't ever feel like it's really one of those like needful thingy types where like yeah. there's the main street and everybody knows yeah. everybody and it's I mean everybody's fairly distant and it's kind of a mirror of what, the area in which I live like we're not all chummy like we're not downtown in a like a suburb like it's like kind of a little more rural and more spread out so uh it just didn't um make sense to lean into too much of like all these additional characters that maybe didn't lend much I mean there were obviously mm -hmm. still townsfolk and neighbors and so forth that that lent itself but it's not that like here's a town and there's a dark history in this town mm -hmm. um so I, I think i'm gonna work that on my next book <laughs> but yeah. didn't yeah. didn't quite work here but i love that i love that but i feel like you very much had history. a here's our world and here's a dark history of our world so yeah you know, whole world yeah whole global world. Sense. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well, i love that um okay so let's see we have a couple of questions all right <laughs> let's, let's hear them folks questions <laughs> Chris says, given the prescience of wanderers with what happened in 2020 after reading the book of accidents, how worried should I be about 2022? Oh, uh, that's funny. I, normally I would be like, I mean, don't, because it's not really like one of those kind of books, but also like there, it, the book contains some little apocalypses and, you know, good luck with that when that happens. So, you yeah. know, uh, sorry about the, the, the tunnel clowns. That's all I'm yeah. saying. It's, I mean... You read yep. it here first. You know what's coming. You can prepare. Hashtag um, tunnel clowns. Yep. Speaking of tunnel clowns, yep. what is your all-time favorite horror novel? Um, it's the first one I read, which mm -hmm. was um, McCammon's Swan Song. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's um before I ever read The Stand, uh, I was like reading fantasy and science fiction as a yeah. kid. Yeah. And, and I don't know if I was like 10, 11, 12 years old and my sister uh, pressed a 980 page horror novel in my hands and it was swan song which is about the end of the world but uh set against a nuclear uh, apocalypse mm -hmm. and uh i was one of those kids who was fairly afraid of a nuclear apocalypse nuclear yeah. apocalypses and serial killers at like 10 years old i shouldn't have been really aware of either but everyone will tell you like no no don't worry kid there's serial killers and if they don't get you then the bombs are going to drop so um mm -hmm. it's fine so everything's good so um here was this book about that and I think I kind of thought well, it was probably a bad idea because like if I'm scared of it I shouldn't read about it but then I read about it and I was like I'm kind of not as scared of it like it mm -hmm. felt better like yeah. I don't know why like maybe it's because if it really happened it wouldn't be this bad or yeah. uh, it just helped me sort of process through it and, and see 
uh, a world in which people are still surviving and being people, which is nice. Um, yeah. Even if it's fiction, it's contextualizing that for me. So uh, probably that book. I mean, I obviously I like a lot of different horror books, but that's the one I, I've reread to um, a number of times. Mm -hmm. When I feel like you touched on what I feel like is is the power of horror, right? Is is a lot of people I know who love horror were very, very anxious to their children and you know are very high anxiety adults. And what horror does is it allows us to engage with these things that that you know explore the darkness around us, right? And they look right at it. They shine a light right at it instead of being like, oh, just ignore it, don't think about it because you're an anxious person. You're gonna be thinking about it no matter what. You gotta think about it, yeah. Whereas horror allows you to engage with it at, you know, at that safe distance of it's on the pages of a book. And it allows yeah. you to sort of like reclaim that yeah. that fear and turn it into something like like you said like oh well it wouldn't be as bad as that or oh people are still surviving um i find when i'm really stressed out when i'm when i'm really really high anxiety horror is my comfort because like no matter what's going on in my life you know I, i'm not being chased by a person with a magic pickaxe who's going to sacrifice me right like, that's just not something i have to deal with in my daily life so like i can handle the rest of it yeah. yet <laughs> yet the same yeah, yet there's always two. Oh, yeah, I definitely have a, a pickaxe over there, too, in the corner. Oh, well, yeah, that's neat. Isn't that nice? Isn't that just for <laughs> flavor, flavor text. That's special. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but I love that. And I love I love horror for that. Um, most of my favorite comfort movies actually are horror. If I'm oh, there. well, what's your, like, do you have a top or a top three or anything? What's your? I mean, I love Annihilation. Yeah, and like, I want sure. a big annihilation kick, kick because it's so pretty, right? And like the sound Sorted, editing, yeah. and the visual, and it's got that nice, like that fun, cuddly bear. Such um, a fun bear. I lo you know, I, I love a good animal. What can I say? <laughs> um, but yeah, so annihilation was definitely one of mine. Another one that I just found like so visually soothing was Midsummer. Oh, oh yeah. It's so oh, very bright. Very bright. Red. Yeah, yeah. The, the reds were very vivid. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but, but my my relationship with horror is different because I was raised in a very, very conservative religion, and so I wasn't allowed to watch rated R movies, and oh, I wasn't sure. allowed to read books that my parents knew had adult content, um, and so so horror was not something that I came to until I was an adult, until I was able to, like, um, begin making my own, my own entertainment decisions. Yeah. So like a lot of classic horror, I haven't been exposed to. So it's been fun as an adult to like, kind of pick and choose, like, oh, now yeah. I'm going to deep dive into this. Now I'm going to yeah. deep dive into that. And like, it's, it's been fun and it's been fun. Um, yeah. Getting to engage with it just kind of on my own terms, I guess, and to really claim it as something that I love and something that is mine out of something that like was very, very much off limits. Have you found any like classic horror films that disappointed you or that did not live up to the hype? Yeah. It's okay if it's no, I'm just curious. You know what one disappointed me the most? It wasn't even horror, it was Bridesmaids. People talked for so many years about how funny Bridesmaids was. <laughs> and I went, I sat down and watched and I was like. Oh man. <laughs> well, I mean, it's fine. Yeah. But I was expecting like, I was expecting like the best. It just wasn't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah, it is, and it's funny, like finally going back and watching these things, right, that you know about, but you don't know about because you've never yeah. actually seen them. You've been um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, well, that was a diversion. Um, <laughs> oh, so okay, Chris asked another interesting question. Um, they asked, "You've written multiple genres. Is it hard to move between them, or is it just writing is writing is writing?" So, like, how? So you're you're not only writing multiple genres; you're writing different different types of books, right? Like you're sure. writing epics, you're writing horror, you're writing middle grade. Like, how do you shift gears? Do you write multiple things at a time? Um, I'm always writing one at a time, and I really <laughs> bleed across. But I mean, in terms of hopping between formats and genres, there's a couple tricks. Uh, one is which I'm kind of, I mean, I'm lazy. Like most of my books are horror. <laughs> Even if they're not called that in their spine, yeah. they're at least a little bit horror. Mm -hmm. um, then it's also like, I uh, i think I recognize that stories have common bones. Like if you if you look at a dolphin and a human, we don't look that much alike. But mm -hmm. if you look at our skeletons, we actually have some pieces that are shared, some shared bones and some, some atavisms that sort of connect us that way. So uh, I do think that story has sort of a shared sense mm -hmm. of, uh, flow and narrative and tension is tension and a lot of books contain horror even if they're whatever um so yeah no I just try to make them connect and work and be their own thing and then sound like me like at the end of the day like my 
ultimate genre is me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's such a good point. Like I'm writing um, middle grade and adult and my middle grade next year is set at a Gothic themed water park. And my adult is set at an abandoned amusement park. So I'm like, yeah, clearly I had parks in the brain and how to make them weirder. Um, yeah, but, you, but you're exactly right. Like the, the style and the types of things that you write, they're always going to be you. Yeah. Just the way that you tell the story might differ depending on genre or audience. Yeah. Um, so, so, and I apologize if I pronounce this wrong. Um, Tariq oh, Tara. says, Tara. Um, when plotting, how do you balance careful planning versus letting the story and characters take you where they want to go? Uh, well, the good news is with Book of Accidents, I didn't plot. <laughs> so I didn't to, <laughs> there was no there. careful planning. It was just it was just chaos reigns. <laughs> um, but I think even when you've plotted, which most of my books have been, you know, I don't want to say tightly, but they've all been outlined and plotted yeah. to some degree um, up until these last couple. I uh, I view it like a cross country trip that you've planned. Like I want to know where I'm going before mm. I get in the car. But then once I'm in the car, if I see, you know, the, the world's biggest alligator or whatever it is, like I'm taking that exit. Like, I don't mm. care if that is not the way I'm going. And if that'll take me 20 miles out of my way, I am going that way because I want to meet that alligator. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not like up close, but like I want to see it and maybe pet it like at a distance. Yeah. So uh, always take the exits, I think is the way that works for me and, and follow, you know, the characters want to do their weird things. And it's like when you, um, tell a story at a game table, like a D&D type story, um, like role playing. I, uh, that was good training for me to sort of follow, you know, cause like I always say, like, you know, you set the, you know, the obviously the cliche thing, but like, oh, you start in a tavern and then there's a dragon attacking the castle nearby, Ho go get them adventurers. And the adventurers like, we're shaking down the orc bartender for like money. And you're like, you can either at that moment as the person running the game be like, no, I want to tell my story now. And you somehow like, well, the tavern burns down. You can't do that now. And you railroad them out the door. Or you'd be like, well, who cares about that dragon? Because this is actually the more interesting story. And it's the story that they want to tell and the characters are involved in. So mm -hmm. um, that's usually where you follow that way. And it gets the most interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's that, it's that special kind of alchemy where you know the shape of the story, you know the path of it but it changes in the telling of it. And it always changes for the better as you get to know the characters, as you get to know the story, like these things that you thought it was going to be aren't the things that it is now. And you know, it's like kids, right? You have an idea of who they're gonna be. They grow up and you're like, you are such a cooler, more interesting person than I could have ever imagined. Yeah. Um, go clean your room. <laughs> Quickly, hurry, why does it smell? Really, yeah. really, really fast. Um, okay, I'm gonna do a few quick questions. Um, and it's it's my uh, it's my version of Kiss, Mary Kill. Okay. Um, so Kiss, Mary Kill, Netflix, Hulu, or HBO Max? Oh, um, gosh, that's a tough one. Uh, uh, and I like it, but I'm going to kill Hulu because it's the, I hate the new interface and I can almost never find anything I really want on there. Uh, I feel like Netflix is still the marry because you're yeah. just like, you know, but the Kiss is HBO Max. There's like, it's kind of a mess. Yeah. Like it doesn't always work in the interface. Sometimes like the things freeze, but there's mm -hmm. some tantalizing content on there. Like Really weird things I couldn't get anywhere else that and some really good movies yeah so there we go that's a good one okay okay um kiss Mary kill audiobooks hardcover or ebooks oh kill uh audiobooks it's nothing personal I I've never ever listened to one all the way through mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever listened to one for more than 10 minutes mm -hmm. um just doesn't jive for me so uh ebooks are a kiss just because it's like I don't do it often and mm -hmm. when I do, it's like, oh, this is neat. I see when you do it on like an airplane, it feels like a vacation yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but then definitely marry uh, the the books, like the hardcover yeah. books. I'm going to marry ebooks because I have very bad wrists. And when I'm holding a book like this for a really long time, it's painful. Like I suffered. I suffered for this book. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I'm sorry about that. I apologize <laughs> about that. Yeah. That's all, right. all right. Okay. So here's a really mean one. <laughs> Bird watching, apple eating. Oh no! Games. Oh god! Oh man! All right. Well, I'm gonna kill board games because as much as like I like that, it's not a it's not a thing. I you know it's not really like a thing. It's yeah. just a thing. It's nice, but so I'd kill that. Uh oh boy, I feel like ooh that's tough. I bird watching has to be the the marry because that's like my 
Mm-hmm. That's my soothing. That's my blankie in, in this mm-hmm. current era. And then apple eating is only kind of like, you can really only eat the good apples at a certain time of the year. So that feels like a, like a kid, like a forbidden sort of dalliance. That's true. Okay, that See, was not I as like, hard as I thought. That was good. All right. You had, you had very well thought out answers to all of this. Thank which you. I appreciate. We used to play a version of this with my family on long road trips, but it was all like the older people in our neighborhood. And it got yeah. really awkward. Um, fortunately, I don't know anyone in your neighborhood, so I couldn't make it that awkward for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so we are going to wrap it up unless anybody has any last minute questions. If oh, you yeah, do, many drop many questions. Q&A. Um, the Book of Accidents, where can they get it? Um, can, can they get it signed here? I think, yeah. Uh, as far as I saw, he has a... Uh, uh, there's a link. Yeah, there's a link. There's a link. And you've yeah. got the book. The copies are signed. Yes. There you go. Um, copies are signed. Magic. The copies are signed. I, it was yeah. magic. Yeah. Yes. So, and thank you. You want it. You want it signed. Um, I, I genuinely love this book. I, I'm on the back loving it. Like, you are I, on the back. It's a fantastic book. You want this in your summer. It's the perfect light, breezy beach read. Um, if you're like Chuck and I, it is. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. That's, it's a good, yeah, fall and, you know. Yes. And then what do we have to look forward to you in the upcoming future? Uh, upcoming, I have my middle grade coming out, which is called Dustin Grimm, which is about a girl who inherits a, a funeral home for monsters. And she has to share that inheritance with a brother she has never met. So, and then um, I wrote, wrote a sequel to Wanderers called Wayward. So Trisha has that and I don't, I feel very scared because it's like, I don't, I barely remember what I wrote in it. <laughs> it's, it's like another 280,000 word bison bludgeoner of a book. And I am very, I don't, I have very little memory of what I put into that. I wrote it during the pandemic and my pandemic brain produced mm-hmm. this book. And now I'm like, I almost like as an artifact, want to be like, I should reread it and find out what the fuck I was thinking. What did I do yeah. here? Yeah. So yeah. it's fun rereading your books and being like, oh, that's what I was going through when I wrote that, but didn't realize I was going through it. But now yeah, that like, I'm on the other oh. side, I can see this book is me grappling with the deconstruction of the organized religion that I've been part of my whole life. Yeah. It's a good note. You think it's about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. No. <laughs> Not quite. Yeah. <laughs> it's about this other thing. Yes. Yes. Oh, good times. Good times. I'm very excited to read Middle Grade from you. Um, and yours too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I have um, this December, I have the final book of my Camelot Rising trilogy, The Excalibur Curse coming out. Um, and then next year I have, in May, I have Hyde, which is my adult debut, which I'm very, very excited about. It's sort of a horror tinge thriller. Um, in June, I have the beginning of my first middle grade series called, I'm just going to say it here, we just changed the title. I haven't announced it yet, but whatever. Um, it's called Wretched Water Park. Um, and then I have a couple more books out next year. You're busy. <laughs> We'll, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. Yeah, well, um, yeah. All right, so final thoughts. Read the Book of Accidents. You're welcome. You're going to love it. When you read it, come talk to me about how relieved you were that that a certain character did not end up dying because if that character had ended up dying, I wouldn't be here today. I, yeah. I would not be friends with Chuck anymore. You'd, so. you'd, be, you'd burn my house down, and that's yeah. okay. I accept that. You can come. You can come. You can come uh, talk to me on Twitter, and we'll we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll commiserate. We'll commiserate about how amazing this book is. I feel right. like that. I feel like that doesn't make sense, but also it's the best. I think it makes kind of sense. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's that kind of book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I I just have to say I feel like if I ever read a disturbing amusement park book, I know who to email about it. Um, I I just wanted to know before we go, did you read Action Park, the nonfiction book? I uh, think you should go buy it or go or the download it. I saw the yeah. it, there's a book too, and it's terrific. So <laughs> it's about a real life horror. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not, I don't live too far from ah! Park. Yeah, so that tracks. I've never been, but I've uh, I've heard the tales. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both so much for a wonderful evening. As um, if you click on that purchase link, um, the screen will pop up and stay there when we go away. Don't forget that we will have this event. Uh, we'll do a little uh, editing, cut a little me out at the beginning and have a recording available to share. Uh, we should be able to email it to all of you who registered for the event and also we'll have it posted in various places. Uh, looking forward to all 700 of your books coming out next year and <laughs> your, and your, and your, your um, sequel to Waters and, and your 
only five, but they'll all be a thousand pages. So <laughs> probably. Sorry. Yeah, in advance. <laughs> Thank you both and have a wonderful evening. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Daniel. Bye. Bye guys. You wouldn't have a virtual bookstore without them. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs>